I'm always curious to see who gets the far chair, because that's the chair that RC always would sit in. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> he'd also have the wandering microphone. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, th there's many times I'd say, no, Mike, <laughs> here, here. Any what's wrong with you people moments coming, Dr. Lawson, there? <laughs> It'd be in that position about there, yeah. But th there was actually a lean. He was leaning into that, yeah. Johnny Mac, do I always need to tell you what you believe? <laughs> Speaking of baptism. <laughs> I just read the questions, <laughs> and I'm also counting the number of Pado baptists on the platform versus the number of Credo baptists on the platform, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I like these odds. <laughs> I know it's a huge and often controversial subject, but could anyone give some advice to someone who struggles on the Pado versus Credo baptism subject who has been praying but still is torn between the two sides and is hoping to have children as soon as the Lord wills. Thank you. That's a really easy one. Have the child baptized. Well, I would say this. <laughs> yeah, no, just to give you some help, and you probably already know it, uh, I think at one point it was the number one tape that was sold by Ligonier. Uh, there was a very friendly uh, debate between R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur on the subject, and each man was allowed to present his arguments uh, for uh, their position. And I think uh, they both uh, presented their position as, as well as their position could be presented. So I, I think you want to hear both sides of the story. And I don't think you want to just hear uh, someone who's Baptistic say what the Presbyterian believes, nor do you want to hear what the Presbyterian, how he couches uh, the Baptistic position. You need to hear from both sides present their own position. So there's not a straw man uh, that's presented. So I would encourage you to get that, uh, that tape. Excuse me? Oh, and it's on YouTube, so you could access it even during the Q&A and, and just listen to it while we're talking <laughs> up here. So how about that? <laughs> Did you want us to go on talking about that? I mean, I, I would say to someone who's struggling with this, and we know there are good people on both sides of this question, good people who are right and good people who are wrong. And um, <laughs> but, but I, speaking obviously as a Paedo-Baptist, uh, would, would encourage you to think profoundly about Paul's statement that your children are holy. Um, that's an unambiguous, straightforward question for, statement from the New Testament. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, your children are holy. Now, we can debate exactly what he means by that. We can clearly debate the implications of that. But if you start with that conviction that the children of believers are holy, Paul doesn't say that to all people about all children. He says it to believers about their children. And if our children are holy in any sense, shouldn't they receive the sign of the covenant of their holy connection to God. So that, that, that would be at least one of the verses to, to think carefully about as you're pondering this issue. Well, well, as someone who was immersed as an adult, um, I, I, I struggled. I mean, I, I, think, that, I think in part th this is a generic question. What does a Christian do uh, about any doctrine? 
if, if there are good men on both, men and women on both sides with, with different views, issues of ecclesiology, polity, eschatology, and, and lots of other things. And, and I think the principle, the reform principle would be uh, that you have to do what your conscience, your, your enlightened biblical conscience tells you. God alone is Lord of the conscience and has left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Westminster Confession. And for me, as a seminary student, I, I went to seminary as a Baptist and, and left as a Presbyterian. And when I went back to Britain, the Baptists didn't want me for some reason. And the Presbyterians didn't know who I was. And they wanted to send me back to college. And, and uh, uh, it, it was like it was like a gestalt. In gestalt psychology, you look at this picture and it's a, it's a rabbit eating a carrot. And then, no, you, you look at it again and it's a witch on a broomstick. <laughs> and, and for me, for me the, the whole issue of baptism was, it, it, you know, I, I had an answer for 1 Corinthians 7 as, as a Baptist, of course, and Steve has volumes to say about 1 Corinthians 7. I do. I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point, all of these, it wasn't as if I, I discovered a text that I'd never seen before. But somehow they came into focus. And then I, I, I saw a pattern. I saw, I saw a trajectory. I saw a narrative that made sense to me. But you must do whatever your conscience tells you. Yeah, you know, it's or, interesting. Or what Steve tells you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I studied under R.C. at Reformed Theological Seminary, and it's interesting. There were back-to-back -back years. At the end of the semester, all the students had emptied the classroom, and it was just R.C. and me. And R.C. would say, Lawson, what do we have to do to make you to be a Presbyterian? I said, I'd love to be a Presbyterian. You have more money. <laughs> you have better architecture. You went to better schools. Uh, I would love to be a Presbyterian. I held out my arm. I said, here, twist, please, twist my arm. Give me your all-time greatest argument for infant baptism. Walk me through these texts. And, I, and I'm there. And so he walked me through those texts, and I just said, R.C., that's not what those verses mean. Um, it's good to know there's some Baptists here. <laughs> um, no, and I said it very respectfully. I said, R.C., that's eisegesis, not exegesis. You're reading into the text what's not in the text. I said, you'd have to go to seminary to come up with this position. I mean, no one would pick up a Bible and come to that conclusion. I mean, you, you would have to connect dots that you would have to be taught how to connect these dots, but the perspicuity of Scripture, that's not clear. That's not self-evident. If you just picked up a Bible and read it, I don't think you would come to that conclusion. So a year passes, I'm back in class, class empties at the end of the semester, Lawson. Lawson, what do we got to do to make you be a Presbyterian? I held out the same arm. I said, R.C., please, I'll, I'll be your youth minister. I mean, twist my arm, and I'll, 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 I'll serve alongside of you. I'll do whatever you need. And, and so, anyway, as, as Derek has said, I mean, your own conscience has to be the umpire and guide and rule. Um, so, only to have somewhat of equal time um, <laughs> so anyway, I, 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 I realize I'm odd man out, but as John Knox said, God plus one makes majority. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, are we moving on? <laughs> are you sufficiently triggered? I've not had my arm broken yet, but um, <laughs> no, this is, this is, I mean, if we were to deal 
in any comprehensive way with this question. We'd have to spend an hour oh, or two okay. talking about it wow. back and forth sure. because it's a, it's a very important question and it's a, a question that, yeah, relates to do you re only read the New Testament or do you also read the Old Testament? Um, <laughs> You know, why in the New Covenant does God exclude a category of people that He loved in the Old Covenant, namely children? If, um, um, but no, we don't want to get, go there. And uh, <laughs> I, 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 think it, I think it's important that both sides in this controversy recognize that both sides are trying to be sincerely biblical, are, are trying to uh, listen carefully to the Word of God, and um, yeah. And oh, absolutely, yeah. and, I, and I'll say this, I, these three men here are smarter than I am, and I'm willing to say are even godlier than I am. So uh, there, there are great men on both sides of the issue. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> I would like to talk about how Presbyterians have more money than Baptists, however. That would be an interesting topic. Point of difference there. Here, as we sit in this facility. <laughs> the, the first time I walked into this facility, I happened to meet a Baptist speaker at the door. And uh, as I looked around, I said to him, how is it that all you Baptists are not post-millennial? And... Uh, <laughs> We are thankful for our host facility. <laughs> are we living in the end times? Yes. In, in the sense that um, the first chapter of Hebrews suggests that the end times have begun. Uh, we are living in the last days. Peter at Pentecost speaks of the last days. Not the last days that Jesus is going to come in the next ten seconds, nine, eight, <laughs> seven. But, but last days in, in the sense that the, the kingdom that is to come has already been inaugurated, and the next great redemptive event is the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, that may be a year away, it may be 10,000 years away, I don't know, but we are in the last days. Why does God allow polygamy in the Old Testament? God's plan for marriage is clearly defined in Genesis 2, 24, <laughs> but there seems to be a disconnect between the principle and the practice. Since Bob is Mr. Old Testament, uh, we'll, we'll let Bob deal with all the children from the polygamy relationship. All those holy children. Oh, yeah. You know, you'd think he'd had a little respect for his elders if he'd <laughs> read the Old Testament. Um, all, all I know for sure is that all the children of those polygam all the, all the sons of that polygamous relationship were circumcised. Back to, back to the question. <laughs> He's so pushy. <laughs> I need to sit between these two men. I think that might. Um, if, if I may just go back to the question previous, and I'm not trying to avoid this particular question, but to follow up on Derek's comment, uh, Oscar Kuhlman, who's an NT scholar, talks about uh, what's happening now to be like D-Day. The invasion of Europe has taken place, and the victory is sure. We're just awaiting that victory in Europe day. Uh, and, and so, all of us are in that end times, 
seeing both the pains and joys of that end times, and that end will come, and the end will certainly for Christians, Jesus wins. And that's the day that we face and, and we're going toward. I always love that image, and I wonder if there are hist hist excuse me, history lovers here who also enjoy that as well. But to, 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 to actually answer the question um, that you're asking regarding polygamy in the Old Testament, I, th this is a much more difficult question than simply that can be answered in 30 seconds or a minute. But I think the question begins by saying, why does God? And this is where I think the point that we have to realize is whatever we see, whatever is happening, is really the result of sin and the fall. This is not God ordaining things, God preparing things, or using it. This is the way in which sins grow and propagate, and we see that happening in the Old and New Testament as well. Certain sins God uh, obviously prevents, and God allows things to continue in some way, and we see the clarification taking place as we especially come into the New Testament from the Old. But in terms of how the communities and the culture in which Scripture was uh, found in, there was a natural progression of sin by which we understand not only the depth of our sin, but ultimately the solution that comes in Christ Jesus. And so whether it be polygamy or any other sin that you, you see around us, in many ways it becomes a teacher that drives us to Christ to recognize the depth of human sin that ultimately finds its solution in Christ Jesus, clarified for us in the New Testament. Could, could, I don't want to step on your applause. No, it was weak, so it's indicating that it wasn't very happy for everyone. <laughs> no, that was good, that was good. Um, I, would it be helpful to think of it analogous to what Jesus says about divorce? Um, divorce was not God's intention for marriage from the beginning, but He regularized it and tolerated it in Moses to a greater extent than He would in the New Covenant because of the hardness of their hearts. And I think we could say there's something similar in terms of God's toleration of polygamy. It was clearly not His plan from the beginning in the garden. It was one man and one woman. Um, but He tolerates offense and sin which then with the coming of the new covenant, he corrects and expects us to live better and more purely than what was tolerated in the old covenant. So there, there may be an analogy or a, a, a similarity there. Why is marriage not considered a sacrament? Well, we have understood sacraments if we have sacraments, to be, um, <laughs> we really like each other. That's uh, why I feel I dare to be so mean to him <laughs> when he's clearly younger and stronger than I am. Um, uh, sacraments, first of all, have to be instituted by Christ as a sacrament. That's the Protestant principle and they are a visible sign of an invisible grace uh, in the spiritual life in connection to Christ and to His redemptive work. So we are baptized as a sign of Christ washing us and giving us new life, a new beginning, a new identity, and we have the Lord's Supper as a sign of Christ constantly coming to us and building us up uh, in the grace of the faith. And uh, Marriage just is neither instituted to be a means of grace, nor does it function as its uh, initial and primary purpose to bring us to Christ and to grow us in grace. It has that secondary benefit, as Joel helped us see so clearly, um, but it, it's a, a different institution um, in its purpose. And uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church says that it is a sacrament, but that has led then to all sorts of distortions in the Roman church about when is a marriage uh, inviolable and, and all sorts of other issues that I think have actually complicated a correct understanding of marriage rather than exalting marriage. Uh, 
we often hear about the prodigal son's salvation, but what would you say to the older son? Stop being a rival. See, I was listening. <laughs> Stop being what? A rival. Oh. Didn't we just hear a lecture about siblings not being rivals? Am I the only one who heard that? I mean... Do you know that Joel, um, Joel Bob, uh, succeeded me as president of Westminster Seminary, California, and he has been so kind and, and so respectful, and I've been so difficult, and uh, he continues to be nice to me so that when I say obnoxious things, he just doesn't know what to say because he's so re polite and so respectful. Um, but, you know, the introduction of him was somewhat inadequate because um, Joel should have been introduced uh, as a Korean-American Presbyterian Dutchman <laughs> because he was raised in the Christian Reformed Church. So he and I are both honorary Dutchmen. I must say, the, the Q&As scare me the most. Uh, <laughs> and this hasn't helped. This has not. I'm sitting next to men that I respect and who are much more learned and smart than I am, so I'm, I'm, I'm hearing them out. But as I do, I don't know exactly when to jump in with an answer, when to jump in with a quip, when to stay out of the way of the fire as much as we can. So let me do this by first, Bob has been an incredibly gracious predecessor. Uh, the first couple years in particular, he would be sitting in my office where we would discuss at length the questions that I have about the institution. He would answer. He's been doing it for 24 years. He knows a thing or two. And, uh, and, but he will always walk out by saying, but Joel, this is not my problem, is what he would always, <laughs> always tell us. To go back to the question, Chris, I think you're trying to hurt us in one direction here about the older brother. Fail, yes, I think that's true. I, part of the pause here is that I think, I believe that I am the older brother in that parable. And, and, and as I'm thinking through it, I'm not the prodigal son in this sense. Certainly all of us are prodigals running away from God in rebellion, in sin. But as someone who was born into a Christian family, minister, never really strayed much in terms of my faith and my understanding of faith, never knowing a day where I was apart from the loving presence of Christ Jesus in my life, having nothing to share around the fire pit in youth group retreats when kids who smoked and came back, ran away from home, came back, got much more attention than simply saying, I loved being home and, and attending church. I wish I had a story to tell. Um, the problem always has been the struggle in, in, in understanding the fact that you are that person who has always experienced this grace and love, but yet it's so common and present, you forget. Uh, you want to be that guy who stands out. You want to be that guy with the story. You want to be that person who can look back to a point, and it leads to a lot of traps. You know, to give you one example, as a minister and as someone who's involved in teaching, sometimes we forget that godliness is more gifted, uh, important than giftedness. Busyness is not necessarily blessedness. But oftentimes, we seek those things that make us stand out, want to stand out, want to hold on to without remembering that constancy of presence and care really was over us. And that sense of jealousy, insecurity, that sense of desire to be noticed and embraced, all unseen, because the problem is not what the Lord has done. The problem is your lack of faith in recognizing and seeing those things. And so, as someone who is a struggling older brother, um, this is a, a fairly meaningful and practical question, and I can't do full justice, I'm sure, to the question being asked. But that's the struggle that I have, and I wonder others do too. 
There's a moment. There's a, there's a beautiful moment in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress Part 2 when Mercy and Christiana are in Interpreter's house and they see a man uh, with a muckrake and he's looking down and all he can see is the muck. But above his head, there's a crown. And, and I think that's, that's the picture that we don't realize, as we should, who we are. This, this brother already was a son, but he was looking down and, and realizing each day as we, as, we, as we wake up in the morning, I'm the child of a king. I'm the child of a king. With Jesus, my Savior, I'm the child of a king. My sister is gay. How do I approach her with the gospel? I think Dr. MacArthur said it yesterday that our entry point is to address the sin, and no one wants to be saved until they know they're lost, and no one needs a Savior until they know they are under the wrath of God. And the Bible is very clear that no homosexual and no effeminate will enter the kingdom of heaven or be a part of the kingdom of heaven. And so it would be a call to repentance, um, to repent of your sin and to turn away from it and to embrace the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as much as we would like to be a peacemaker and to extend um, love, which we do extend love. We speak the truth in love, but that's the point. We speak the truth, and it is, um, it, it is a, a, a violation of the holiness of God at a very deep level, and there must be um, the, 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 the Holy Spirit alone can bring the conviction of sin. We cannot bring conviction of sin, but as we'll even talk tonight, when we preach the Word, 2 Timothy 4, 2, the very first two things you do when you preach the Word is to reprove and to rebuke. Then you exhort with patience and instruction. But the reproving is the exposure of the sin, and the rebuking is the call for repentance. Um, and then the instruction or the exhortation is the persuasion and the summons to leave your sin and to come to the mercy and the grace of God who alone can forgive sin. And as it was quoted last night, Isaiah 1 verse 18, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. And there, that's our point of, of address. It's, it's not because you're lonely. It's not because you need new friends. It's not because you're feeling insecure. It's not because you were rejected as a child. It's not because, no, it's you have sinned, and you're living in sin. And it is, it, it is a gross and despicable sin in the eyes of a holy God, but He is a, a God of much grace and mercy as well. And if you will confess your sin and repent, He will give you a new start and, you know, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on to the upward call of <clears throat> God in Christ Jesus, but you're going to have to forget it and turn your back to it. it don't, oh, go ahead, please. I agree with you, what you're saying, but, but don't we have to make clear in this kind of situation that the gay person doesn't have to just repent of being gay and then that will be all that's necessary, as if this is the only sin that matters in the eyes of God. 
I mean, our, our message needs to be the person who doesn't know Christ as Savior is alienated in every part of life from God. And the whole life is sinful, not just one part of the life. And to be sure, there has to be repentance for every part of the life that's alienated from God. But I think sometimes um, people who wrestle with a very, from our point of view, obvious public sin hear us saying, it's only that one sin that matters. And I think we have to be careful about that. It's the alienation from God. It's the rebellion of God. It's the problem of the heart in resisting God sure. that manifests itself in this sin, but in many other sins as well. Absolutely. I mean, John 16, verse 8, the Spirit has come into the world to convict men of sin, righteousness, and judgment of sin because they believe not. I mean, the damning sin ultimately is the rejection of Christ. Um, so, I, I totally, completely agree with you. As the question is, is asked, though, it, it is a glaring sin, but it is obviously uh, the sin of unbelief, uh, your rejection of, of Christ and the free offer of His grace is um, you're trampling underfoot the precious blood of Christ and insulting the Spirit of grace and treating it as a common thing. I, I agree with both men. I, I think there's lots of truth there we ought to keep in mind. If I may add a caveat to this, one of the struggles that we have as Christians is distinguishing and balancing the message with the manner. Um, and I think this is some of the generational struggles we have. There is the truth. How do we display and teach that truth? I feel for the person who's asking this question. I can't imagine what he or she feels as they see their child walk in sin. And, and to be honest, as our brothers point out, at the end, prayer is, there, there's really nothing else one can do to pray, but to pray and to depend upon the Lord for His Spirit to work in that person or that child's heart. At the same time, as we approach, and I want to be careful how I say this, that we remember that the person is still a bearer of the image of God. We also remember that like any other sin, it requires the love and stick to of those who are around that individual to walk with that person as they journey and struggle through their sin, to be able to display the love of Christ and the truth of Christ in their lives. Now, it takes wisdom to distinguish what that looks like what the clear message is and what the clear goal is of repentance and rejection and understanding that God calls us to a certain life of holiness. Yet in getting there, our engagement is just as important as the message we proclaim, the manner and the love with which we are able to display and discuss will be an impactful witness in, in, in terms of helping that person see the love of Christ and the righteousness of Christ in you as, they, as you minister to them and pray for them as well. Um, I, I mean, this is one of the most difficult questions in our culture right now. And I think I'd want to, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but I, I think I'd want to add a couple of uh, nuances. And, and I think I'd want to distinguish between same-sex attraction and, and actually acting out on that same-sex attraction. I, I think that because of our culture, um, I, I think because of, uh, I mean, some, some people have a disposition to be um, hot-tempered. Some people have a disposition to be prideful. Uh, and and I, I, I can accept the fact that some people struggle with same-sex attraction. If, if this was a sibling of mine, I would want them to know that I love them. Uh, I'm there for them. I'm going to help them through their life's journey. Uh, I certainly want them to know, and, and they probably already know um, that this is that this is sin, that this violates uh, the commandments of God. 
Um, but I'd also want them to at least sense that if they are going to live a celibate life, struggling with same-sex attraction, that, that there's help there, that the gospel can help them, that the gospel can empower them. And, and, and without that knowledge, there's, there's hopelessness. Um, so, so I, I, as well as the negative, as well as the, this is sin, and, and unless you repent, uh, there are damning consequences, I, I think I also want them to know that there's hope, and there's power, and there's, there's strength in the gospel, and that Jesus can actually help them overcome this struggle, which they may have for the rest of their lives. We'll close with this last question and maybe just briefly uh, hear from each of you uh, in, in the short minutes that we have remaining. <laughs> what is the single greatest threat facing the Reformed Church today? And there's a specific question about what the men of the church must do to, uh, to rise up and to, to lead in this moment. So the greatest single threat facing the Reformed Church today. Compromising to the culture of our time, the, the cultural pressures uh, soften our message. Uh, he took my answer, but <laughs> I think it ties to the authority of the Word. I mean, it's a generational thing. Every generation uh, needs to defend the authority of the Word, but I, I really do think there's an erosion of scriptural authority here within the churches that we're concerned about. Well, I certainly agree with that, uh, all that's been said. I, I would say one specific is um, the laity failing to encourage ministers to preach the Word. Yeah, and I agree with uh, everything that's been said, and as Bob has mentioned, to encourage the preaching of the Word to pinpoint one particular doctrine that I feel ha is not preached in most Reformed churches is the doctrine of regeneration and the doctrine of the new birth. And we have so belabored justification by faith alone, and rightly so, Paul, Romans 3 through 5, Galatians 2. Um, but we have forgotten, even in the order salutis, what precedes justification by faith. And where does this faith come from? And what does it mean to be born again? And do you have to actually be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven? Um, is it enough to be baptized? Is it enough to be sprinkled? Is it enough this or that? What is it at the point of entrance from being outside the kingdom to enter into the kingdom, what did Jesus mean, except you be born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven? So I, I think that there has been a, a, a disregard for the great doctrine that electrified uh, the colonies in England during the Great Awakening, the nature and the necessity of the new birth, which was trumpeted, um, especially by Whitfield and even the, uh, the Wesleys, that man is ruined by sin, he's redeemed by the Savior, but he is regenerated by the Spirit. And so we need to come back to preaching, you must be born again. Um, a woman came to Whitfield and said, why do you keep telling us we must be born again? And he said, because, dear woman, you must be born again. Thank you, gentlemen. Grateful for you, each of you.